Okay. So now we come to the what Venerable Makachana has to say, how he is going to explain this particular sutta. And this is where we kind of get the clear insight into how the idea of perception works. So this is what he said. Uh, yeah, reverence. Uh, the Buddha gave this brief passage for recitation, then entered his dwelling without explaining the meaning in detail. Judgments driven by proliferating perceptions beset a person. Uh, if they don't find anything worth approving, welcoming, or getting attached to in the source from which these arise, uh, just this is the end of the underlying tendencies to desire, repulsion, views, doubt, conceit, the desire to be reborn, and ignorance. This is the end of taking up the rod and the sword, the end of quarrels, arguments, and disputes, of accusations, devices, speech, and lies. This is where these bad, unskillful qualities cease without anything left over. This is how I understand, this is how I understand the detailed meaning of this passage for recitation. Colon, should be colon there, I think, because it comes now. Okay, so this is how he understands it. Uh, my consciousness arises dependent on the eye and sights. Uh, yeah? So uh, when you have an eye, when you have the ability to see, and when there are things to be seen, then consciousness eg engages, right? Consciousness actually happens. Uh, it's kind of uh, the way it is. Uh, um, so that, I think, is a standard way that this is expressed in the suttas for all the five, all the five external senses, and also for the mind. Uh, so when the sense organ is there and the object is there, then based on that, uh, the consciousness arises. Uh, but does it always arise? Uh, and uh, sometimes you may have the eye, yeah, and maybe there are objects around, but maybe you are listening. Maybe you're listening so much or doing something so much. Like, for example, you are watching a nice video or reading a book or something, and you're so immersed in what you're doing uh, that you can't hear what is going around you, uh, going on around you, yeah? I'm sure many of you had that feeling sometimes. Uh, and so there is actually, the ear is there and the sound is there, but still you don't hear it. Uh, which is kind of interesting. So, this, so obviously this is not quite enough. Uh, yeah? There is eye consciousness arising depending on eye and sight, but there's one more thing that is required, uh, that is attention. Uh, yeah? If your attention is elsewhere, it's not going to happen. Uh, so where is your attention? Uh, this is kind of becomes a critical thing. Uh, let's look at the next factor here. Uh, the meeting of the three is contact. Uh, yeah, so when you have uh, the eye and the eye consciousness, uh, sorry, and the object and then the eye consciousness, uh, yeah, the th those three coming together, that is contact. Passa is the Pali word. Uh, and passa quite literally means to touch. So there is like a touch. This is kind of touch in a metaphorical sense, yeah? The, the touch of the eye. The eye touches the world, if you like. The eye contacts the world. Uh, and when the eye contacts the world, the eye consciousness arises uh, and you see as a consequence. Uh, so one way of thinking about the idea of contact or touching the world, uh, one translation that I kind of like is to just call it experience. Uh, at that moment, you have an experience through the eye. Yeah? So contact, passa, can be called experience in this way. Uh, the meeting of these three is experience. Uh, yeah, there's an experience happening here. Yeah, like, like now, you are seeing something. That is the eye, the object, ceiling. Yeah, and then eye consciousness, bing, light goes on the ceiling. I can see the ceiling. Contact, you have an experience of ceiling. And when you have an experience of ceiling, what happens then? Contact is a condition for feeling. So you have a feeling about the ceiling. I don't know, good, bad, neutral, good, bad, who knows? <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, I guess. Uh, yeah, not, nothing kind of really spectacular about this ceiling, kind of ordinary ceiling, uh, neutral feeling maybe. Uh, what do you think? What do you, what do you feel when you see the ceiling? you feel good or bad or neutral? Uh, kind of ne neutral? <laughs> it's like some of those places you travel in the world, you look into the ceiling and the ceiling is painted. Yeah, it's like some super fancy ceiling. So this is not quite as interesting as that. Uh. So you have a feeling about what you see? Uh, yeah? And when you have a feeling, what you feel 
you perceive. Yeah, perception. When I name this ceiling, that's the perception right there. I have a sense about what this is. Yeah, I make sense of it. And that is the perceiving. Yeah. So here you can see how perception arises through the sequence of sense contact. How we contact the world through the senses, that is how perception arises. Yeah? So this gives us a grip on perception. So let's go back to the beginning again, because uh, we want to look at this in a bit more detail. So go back to the start. Eye consciousness arises dependent on the eye and sights. Uh, yeah? So I already said that that is not quite enough. You also need the attention. You need the uh, uh, samanahara, yeah? the kind of the direction of the mind at that particular point. Only what you attend to will you become aware of, right? So you're attending to this, okay, then you become aware of it. So what about that attention? Where does the attention come from? Why is it that you attend to certain things and not others? What is it that drives the attention? And this is where it starts to get very interesting, because once you start to understand what drives the attention, then you start to understand the power and how we can develop the mind. Yeah? So what drives the attention is two different things. One is internal factors, internal to yourself, and the other one is the external factors. And the external factors is quite easy to understand. Yeah? So external factors is, for example, you hear the pling, you hear the pling here. The, you didn't hear the pling? Wow, well done. You're so focused on what I'm saying. You don't hear the pling. I heard the pling. That was the lift over there, I think, or something like that. The lift goes pling. And that is the external factor. Yeah? The, something from the outside uh, is so strong. Uh, it has such a strong impact on the senses uh, that you cannot avoid. Attention goes there. Yeah? The attention is driven by external factors in this way. You have a car outside honking the horn, you will hear it because the horn is so loud. Or you hear the fire alarm going off or some powerful or someone touching you, yeah? You will feel it because the external impact is so strong. Yeah? And so this gives rise to attention, yeah? So this is the external world. And we cannot do much about that. That is like a given. Not entirely given because even with the external things, if you have a very still and peaceful mind, you can direct your mind more easily. Even external things will not be as disturbing for you. Yeah, you know the old saying about Jan Shah, it is not, uh, it is not uh, the sound that is disturbs you, it is you who disturb the sound. Yeah, that's what that means. It's because we have developed the mind and we are able to avoid uh, engaging with the sound. That means we don't disturb the sound, we don't engage with it. Uh, and so we can let it go. Yeah. And so even external things have a limited kind of impact on us, but it is more given than the internal things. But what we attend to in the world also depend enormously on our internal qualities. Yeah? Who are we as a person? What is important to us? What is interesting to us? Yeah? What, what kind of what works? So for example, just right now when we're sitting here together, yeah, sometimes you probably drift off, right? You're thinking about something else for, for a while. Yeah, it's true, isn't it? That's just the way it has to be. And that, that doesn't mean you are a terrible, bad person just because that happens. That's just the way it is. You drift off sometimes. And that is why do you drift off? Because of your past conditioning, your attention. It is what interests you. Yeah? Oh, now this monk is getting a bit boring. Okay, you think about something else. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So you kind of go off in some other kind of realm. And, and this is how it often is. Yeah? So these are the internal forces that drive our attention, either to what is being said, or to something else that we want to think about, or we're kind of looking around, or whatever it might be. And that internal driving, which drives our attention, that is where we can do something. That is what we can change. Yeah? So this a perceptual sequence of consciousness arising dependent on the eye of sight depends to a very large extent on the development of our minds. Because that is what decides where our attention goes, how our attention goes, what are the qualities that go with that attention, what that attention will do with the object that it meets. Will it criticize it or will it have loving kindness and, and compassion? All of these things come with the attention that we have. And so this is how this whole perceptual sequence is driven by the quality of the attention that we have in our life. And so attention 
again, is related to perception, right? So these things are very closely related to each other. So how we perceive the world will then affect our attention. The views that we have will affect the attention. If you were a Christian, you wouldn't be here. Yes, yeah? so that affects your attention to the Dhamma, right? <laughs> Obviously, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are your views. So everything affects what we attend to, what is interesting for us, where we lend an ear, what what is important to us. And so then you can see, yeah. So then, when your attention comes in because you're interested, then the contact happens, the experience happens. When that experience happens, you will have a certain feeling. Yeah, and whether you enjoy something, yeah, whether something is happy for you or it is suffering for you, will depend on your conditioning. Yeah, yeah so you can, many, some, it's possible to sit in an assembly, listen to a talk, yeah, and some people think it's terrible, other people think it's great. Yeah, it's, so some people experience happiness, some people experience dukkha. It's exactly the same talk. Why do some people experience dukkha? Because their attention is different. Yeah, yeah their attention is. Uh, Geared in a different way. Why do other people experience sukkha, happiness? Because their attention comes with different perception, comes with a different understanding. So the attention is different. So how we feel about any given experience that we have depends to a very large extent on the quality of our attention that we bring to that point. And then Whatever we feel, what you feel, you perceive. Yeah, whatever we, whenever we feel something, there's also perception going with that. Uh, the most basic kind of perception is actually feeling itself. Feeling is also a kind of perception in a certain way. But then there are other perceptions, yeah, enemy, friend, uh, uh, all, all of these kind of things, which then can kind of make things uh, you know, worse and worse down the track. Yeah. And so now you're starting to get an idea of how, how all of these things go and why the development of the mind is so powerful. Because when we develop the mind, our world starts to change. What we see is literally different. How we see things is literally different. How we hear all of these things are different because of that. And it's far too easy to think in life that we are like the Vic victims of the world, right? The world kind of hits us and these kind of things, and we are the victim of kind of the world coming in. But actually, no, we are not so much victims. We are active participants in what the world is perceived as and how the world actually comes to us. And that is actually really, really good news, yeah, because that means that, uh, you know, a lot of things like the, the negative things in the world, uh, they can affect you to a very large extent, uh, or they may not affect you at all. Yeah, and that depends entirely on how you develop your mind, how you think about these things. And so, yes, yeah, so if the world is going very badly, right now the world is many strange things happening in the world, is that going to affect you or not? Well, it depends on your perception. It does not necessarily, or your attention, it is not just the way things are. Yeah, you can actually deal with these things in the right way, depending on how you, uh, how you develop your mind, how you incline your mind. That's really, really good news, because instead of getting depressed about everything in the world, all we have to do is change our perceptions a little bit, and then everything is okay, and it's not a problem after all. This is the kind of the Buddhist way of dealing with external problems. So, uh, yeah, so far so good. So you perceive, yeah, what happens next? What you perceive, you think about. Yeah, so when we perceive things, uh, when we have perceptions about things in the world, uh, then we tend to think about them. Uh, yeah, so I sit here, I perceive ceiling, and if I was the owner of the BGF, I would say, oh, ceiling, maybe, <coughs> maybe it needs painting, maybe it has a crack over there, oh, I need to fix it up, yeah, oh, the aircon is a bit too cold. <laughs> Are you okay in the aircon? Are you dealing with the aircon? Are you, are, are you too cold? For me, it's great, but I don't know about for you. I, <laughs> I'm really happy. <laughs> Please, uh, yeah. Or, or whatever it is, yeah. When, once you perceive things, you tend to think about them because they tend to have meaning for you in a certain way. Yeah? And this is kind of the point here. Yeah? This is the point about we're talking about papancha. Yeah. So, for example, when I see coffee, it has me meaning for me. Yeah. yeah? Craving arises. This is my coffee. Don't, don't touch my coffee. 
And so because things have meaning, we think about them. And then when you, because you think about them, you kind of investigate them a little bit, uh, then you proliferate. This is, in fact, a large part of what proliferation is about. You start thinking, and then it goes on, yeah? Well, oh, this is mine, I am this, this is my view about things, yeah? And it carries on like this, on and on in this particular way. So. And this uh, becomes then the proliferation, as I mentioned before. Mine, uh, conceit, and views, uh, yeah? So uh, ownership, conceit, and views. Uh. And what you proliferate is the source from which judgments driven by proliferating perceptions beset a person. So, um, So this is like the further addition, yeah, the further proliferation. Uh, you start proliferating, which is driven ultimately by the sense of self, uh, and then uh, it goes on to these uh, kind of various judgments and more perceptions and more proliferation, uh, and all of these things beset you. You become a victim of these kind of things. Uh, yeah? And it all starts out with how we attend to things, uh, how the quality of attention, what the quality of attention is. Uh, and especially if that attention that we have at the very beginning is imbued with craving. Yeah, very often our attention will be imbued with craving. I was saying that uh, whether we experience something, either it can be an external impact on the senses, uh, or it can be we go out into the world. Yeah? And craving is one of those things that drive us into the world. Yeah? I need coffee. That drives me to the coffee. To the coffee. <laughs> And uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? So craving drives us and drives the attention in a sense. Uh, the same thing with the conceit, I am. Yeah? I am. You want to be somebody. And your relationship to the world around you will then be uh, shaped by your sense of who you are. And the same thing with views. So these are the things that shape our attention. Uh, and then this whole sequence happens as a consequence. Uh, yeah? And then the perceptions and everything arise from these kind of things. Uh, so what we need to do then, again, coming back to this idea of attention being the source of all of these things, uh, what we have to do is we have to change the way we attend to things. Uh, how do we do that? Well, actually by developing our perceptions, uh, yeah, which this is large part about, by developing our views, uh, by seeing things differently. And as we develop our perceptions and views, uh, as our meditation works, but even just by very simple things like virtue and kindness and these kind of things, uh, generosity, all of these things would develop your mind and change your mind in certain ways. And then you start to see things differently. Your attention changes, and then these proliferations don't happen in the same way anymore as a consequence. So this is roughly a rough idea, and this is kind of the, uh, the background, the theory of why developing perception of views is so important. So there's... Does it make sense? Are you? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, I'm glad to hear that because it's not obvious it should make sense. So, um, okay, so let's um, let's carry on. <clears throat> so this occurs with respect to sights known by the eye in the past, future, and present. Yeah, so all sights that are known by the eye have this kind of uh, potential for proliferation, for proliferating, proliferation of the mind. And then he goes on to say the same thing about the other senses. Ear consciousness arises dependent on the ear and sounds. Nose consciousness arises dependent on the nose and smells. Tongue consciousness arises depending on the tongue and tastes. Body consciousness arises depending on the body and touches. Mind consciousness arises depending on the mind and ideas, or mind objects, or whatever you want to call it. The meeting of the three is experience. Experience is a condition for feeling. What you feel, you perceive. What you perceive, you think about. What you think about, you proliferate. 
what you proliferate is the source from which judgments driven by proliferating perceptions beset a person. This occurs with respect to ideas known by the mind in the past, future, and present. So, um, that is the basic uh, idea of this particular sutta. Yeah, and it gives you an idea of what has to be done and how to, uh, how to deal with things. Um, the uh, rest of the sutta, um, I think we can go through fairly, fairly quickly because I think the main ideas have already been expressed. I don't want to carry on too much more with this particular sutta. Let's just go through the rest fairly quickly now. When the when there is the eye, sights, and eye consciousness, it will be possible to discover evidence of experience. Yeah, when there is these three things coming together, you will experience things. Whether you want to or not, experience will happen. When there is evidence of experience, it is possible to discover the evidence of feeling. Feeling always comes together with experience. These things are linked to each other. When there is evidence of feeling, it will be possible to discover evidence of perception. Perception always comes with feeling and experience. These are linked to each other. Where there is evidence of perception, it is possible to discover evidence of thought. When we perceive, we tend to think about things. Yeah? We tend to ruminate over them. They become uh, important for us somehow. And even for Arahants, even for enlightened people, this will be true to some extent. They, they will think about things that they perceive because this is the way the mind works. Some things will be important and they will be necessary to think about. Uh, where there's evidence of thought, it will be possible to discover evidence of being beset by judgment driven by proliferating perceptions. And uh, so this is the last one here. And this is where there is that distinction between the arahant and the ordinary person. Yeah, for the arahant, uh, actually, this is not the case. So this here really exemplifies just the ordinary person. Uh, the arahant will not be proliferating. That's kind of the point of the arahant. Uh, and the arahant's thoughts will always be in line with the Dhamma, and they will not kind of just grow randomly in all directions. Uh, so this is where we see the distinction between the two. Uh, but generally speaking, you can assume that an unenlightened person will proliferate at least to some degree. And our job is to reduce the proliferation. And as you reduce the proliferation, you become more mindful. Yeah? This is in part what sense restraint is about. Uh, you become more clear. You become more aware of what is going on around you. And when you are more aware and more clear, you become more kind. You become more caring. You have more compassion because you are able to use your mind in a better way. Yeah? So this things kind of go together in this way. So we have a path of reduction of proliferation. And that path of reduction in proliferation goes together with all the other good qualities that we're trying to develop on this path. And then he says the same thing for the other five senses. Yeah, when there's evidence of these things, then it happens. And then comes the next, the last part of the sutta. Where there is no eye, no sights, and no eye consciousness, it will not be possible to discover evidence of experience. Yeah, you cannot experience anything through the eye if these things are not there. Where there is no evidence of experience, there will be no evidence of feeling. You won't feel anything because there is nothing happening through the eye or anything else. So there's no feeling yet. And when there is no feeling, there is no evidence of perception. Perception will be gone. When there is no evidence of perception, it will not be possible to think, because thinking requires perception. <laughs> and then, when there is no evidence of thinking, it will not be possible to discover evidence of being beset by judgments driven by proliferating perceptions. So when you don't think, then there is no proliferating perceptions. And then the same thing for all the other senses, going down all the way to the end. So um, what the Buddha or Venerable Mahakachana is saying here, which is actually quite profound, he's saying that 
ultimately you need to make an end of all of these uh, these things yeah and uh, everything really has to come to a stop and when everything comes to a stop then of course there is no more proliferation because then there can be no thinking because uh, the uh, senses and everything kind of comes to a stop but um, what is um, kind of missing here which is a uh, uh, kind of um, imply, but not really said directly, is that you don't actually have to make an end of all of these things for proliferation to stop. Proliferation also stops when you become gradually, as you practice the path, yeah? And eventually you becoming an arahant, there is no more proliferation when you become an arahant. So this is kind of also the point here. So it's not just about making an end of everything. Arahantship itself, or even just a little bit of practice of the path, leads to less proliferation, yeah? More mindfulness, more kind of clarity of the mind, all of these kind of things. Uh, basically, that means that you are not proliferating as much. Uh, that's kind of the idea behind this. Uh, and uh, so you probably all know how nice it is to get rid of a bit of proliferation. Uh, yeah, when the mind becomes more clear, there's more mindfulness, uh, there's less thinking, uh, there's less kind of worry about and anxiety about the things of the world. Uh, it's beautiful when that happens. Uh, and so you can see straight away that proliferate, proliferation is actually a uh, a negative impact on your life. That's really what you can see from this. So anyway, I don't want to belabor this too much more. So let's see what, how this whole thing ends, because it ends quite nicely as well. This is how I understand the detailed meaning of that brief passage for recitation give the, given by the Buddha. If you wish, you may go to the Buddha and ask him about this. You should remember it in line with the Buddha's answer. Then those mendicants, approving and agreeing with what Venerable Makachana said, rose from their seats and went to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side, and told him what had happened, adding, Mahakachana clearly explained the meaning to us in this manner, with these words and these phrases. And the Buddha replies, Mahakachana is astute mendicants. He has great wisdom. If you came to me and asked this question, I would answer it in exactly the same way as Mahakachana. This, that is what it means, and that is how you should remember it. Yeah, so this is kind of how the Buddha uh, supports his monks in a sense. Yeah, if they give a good answer, he says, I would say the same thing. Yeah, maybe he wouldn't say exactly the same thing, but it means that it is basically right what he is saying. Yeah. And so uh, the Buddha kind of uh, gives authority to his uh, senior monastics when they have achieved awakening in this way. Uh, and that, of course, is what a good teacher should do. So uh, that's kind of, uh, it's kind of a nice thing to, to see that happening. Uh, and he praises uh, his uh, senior disciples as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah. When he said this, Venerable Ananda said to the Buddha, Sir, suppose a person who was weak with hunger was to obtain a honey cake or a honey ball. Wherever they tasted, they would enjoy a sweet, delicious flavor. True? In the same way, wherever a sincere, capable mendicant might examine with wisdom the meaning of this exposition of the teaching, they would gain joy and clarity. Sir, what is the name of this exposition of the teaching? Well then, Ananda, you may remember this exposition of the teaching as the honey cake discourse. <laughs> That's how it became the Madhu Pindaka Sutta. Madhu is honey, yeah, in Malay as well. So you know this word already, so it's good. Huh? So you have an advantage when it comes to learning Pali because you already have some of the vocabulary here. <laughs> That is what the Buddha said. Satisfied Venerable Ananda was happy with what the Buddha said. So uh, there you are. Um, let's have a quick, do some quick meditation again, and then we will uh, we'll carry on with some questions shortly. 